I did notice that when I was writing, your homework is up, and I have you do some manipulations of wave functions, including some spectroscopy, so that's why we're going to cover it today. It's actually relatively easy. Um, I noticed that I had made a mistake transcribing my, my I was using your textbook oddly, uh, and the textbook wrote out the wave functions in kind of a weird way, and, and I realized I had not put this to the rock, so I had like R over 2 A naught, A naught remember is a bore, that's about half a, half a, half a nanometer, right, half a nanometer. No, half an angstrom, so 0.05 nanometers, sorry about that. Um, I had R over 2 and R over 4, I, I just straight up didn't copy it right, it was just that easy. So your homework, I've got them right, here they are. Uh, I don't care if you don't write these down. I, okay, I'm sorry about it. I made a mistake. Of course, on homework and exams, I'll have it right, so not, hopefully not a big deal. I also want to point out that, remember we were talking about radial? Don't forget that the angular ones are still there. That kind of came up last time when we were talking about normalization in Jacobians. And yeah, don't forget that these are still there. And let's see, uh, when it comes to S functions, remember that we use spherical harmonics. Spherical harmonics are the solutions to the angle bits. So here, I, I should put that. I should, I should put that on here. Remind, in case you forget what that little symbol means. Um, there's two ways. If I, okay, let's say I forget that again. So let's say I forget to put the angle bits. Um, you should know that this is the angle wave function because it's multiplied by the radial, and there's an L in an M, and that's a signification, of course, that that has to be. That's only for radial parts, right? Uh, S, uh, radi uh, so the radial, the angular, remember that S's just have normalization, they're just constant, that's why we represent them as spheres, there's no angle dependence. I have a question on the last homework that hopefully got you thinking about what that means for, um, you know, what does it mean for the wave function to be constant, how does it look, of course it looks like a sphere. If there's a node, then, then it looks like a P state, if there's two nodes it looks like a D state, that was the answer to one of your questions, so I hope that wasn't lost. Uh, so again, the S states, there, there's really nothing there except just some constant that normalizes, but of course there's always a constant that normalizes it. Uh, it gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, this is obviously a 2P state, so you should be able to read that off. M equals zero, that makes it a, a Z, uh, PZ state, and I believe Z is cosine, um, yeah, it's just cosine, cosine theta. And um, M equals zero means that uh, there's no uh, E. Um, Okay, and there's the three, and of course you see, um, you see the r to the l behavior, of course that's r to the zero, so there's no r in here. Then we see the exponential die-off, uh, you can see that, you can see r to the l here. Uh, and then don't forget that there's this, the, you can see that right here, you can see this bridging type, remember that there's like a bridge between r to the l and the exponential die-off, and that's this part here, and that brings us, uh, that's what gives us nodes and whatnot. Uh, of course, we solved the uh, Schrodinger equation, which gives us an energy. Again, don't forget that the, the hydrogen atom is really weird that the energies are negative, right? And that's because, look at the potential. The potential is the, is the only thing there. The only thing there is the potential energy, right? And it's negative uh, because electrons and protons, uh, one has a negative, one has a positive charge. And so, uh, so the potential is negative. It never turns positive. So all the energies are negative, and that actually does a lot of weird things. I'll tell you. I'll show you an example in the next hour. Uh, also, some historical stuff. Don't worry about. It. I'm not going to test you on this, but just whatever. N equals one. The first row. We have this old German uh, type of um, uh, uh, nomenclature for it to say that that's actually the K shell to so the, the one S. I might say the K shell, L shell. I I don't know why. I don't care. Uh, but anyway, I, I do actually run into this sometimes. Maybe, maybe some of you will go to grad school and see that. Some of you are going to grad school, so that's great. Uh, L equals zero, F, now you know these, so I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, still reviewing. Um, yeah. uh, okay, so I drew some wave functions. Nothing wrong there, didn't screw those up, I'm just reminding you. Uh, now, I would want you to be able to identify those on the test. Uh, okay, so again, let me, let me make this very dramatic. Um, you got a test pretty soon, <laughs> two, two, two weeks. I'm probably going to throw some of these up, up there and say, hey, what's what? I don't know. Why not? Why am I even telling you? I don't know. Uh, but I have to ask something, right? You know, I to, like to ask a lot of questions. Okay, the way to identify an S is that it, uh, the wave function has a finite value at R equals zero. 
And remember that that's, that actually ought to be kind of bad because electrons touching protons, because of what I just drew up there, technically releases infinite amount of energy. Uh, but the answer to that is that you really want to look at this with the Jacobian, uh, 4 pi r squared times the wave function because remember that I am drawing something in 3D versus r, which is 1D, and that's literally just because this board is flat and I have just an x-axis as opposed to an x and y. You know like how I tried to draw 3D things with some varying success. Um, greatest problem, you know, that people have is that there's so many things that are important that depend on multiple variables, yet we can only see 2D, and if we're very good with illustrations, we can make 3D, but some things are like 10D in any way. Um, so when I draw something that's 3D uh, on a flat plane, it's going to get some of the things just aren't represented correctly. Uh, the best solution is, is to multiply by the Jacobian, and you see uh, where this is really much more representative of the probability of where is this electron, and then you see that actually, no, it's nowhere near the center where the nucleus is. Because that, again, you heard me say this last time, it's an infinitely small point, and it just can't find it because it's infinitely small. So there you go. I also mentioned something I was kind of fast. You know I do all this, I, just at night, I look at YouTube and I look about um, Dirac equation and Hawking radiation. It's kind of cool. A lot of the stuff on YouTube is very, it's understandable, especially now that you've had this class. You should be able to read this stuff and follow along pretty well. Um, some of those, like Neil deGrasse Tyson's books uh, in, the, in the airport, uh, those, you now know enough to read those like relatively easily. I don't think without this class, I don't think those books could, like, I know it's meant for, like, everyone to read because it's in an airport. I don't think you could get much out of that unless you had this class. I think you might like those kinds of books. Um, anyway, so I forgot what I was talking about. I totally, what? Does anyone know what's going on? Because I apparently just, I just froze up. I was talking about Neil deGrasse Tyson. Graphs of wave functions. And, and what again? Graphs of wave functions. Graphs of wave functions. Um, you can't hit the rate, the center of the atom. Oh, 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 yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm just gonna, you know what I'm gonna do next semester? I'm just gonna show the videos. I'm just gonna pull down the screen, watch the video, and say, it doesn't get better than this, I'm losing it. Um, so it turns out that string theory is, all right, so, so notice I'm just saying that like, okay, the nucleus is infinitely small, the electron's technically infinitely small, but the way I'm solving these equations is that everything's a point vertical, but they're, but they're not. We know that electrons are yay big, I don't know how they know that. We know that protons are yay big. I mean, it's small, but it's not zero. That's apparently what string theory is about. So anyway, I just thought that was kind of cool. Uh, I was here that I thought it was cool. I don't know Okay, okay, anyway, still reviewing uh, P states. Look at the wave functions I've drawn. Okay, I only put one P state up there. Uh, the book has some of the others. You can Google the others, whatever. Just graphs are graphs, equations are equations. Um, it's a little bit more helpful to graph them. P states are, are not hard. Now, notice in the one P state I drew a, I wrote a two PZ state up there. It's R e to the minus R, and so that means that it's gonna, this one actually will start at zero, and there's no node, because R e to the minus R can't, it can't have a node. That's impossible. Uh, now, the reason that uh, P's, P's are zero, are, are zero, zero, unlike S's, so, so notice that you can identify an S from a P, uh, D's also would, would start at zero as well. Um, the re so, so that's how you would identify an S from the non-S's. The reason it's at zero is that although I mentioned why this guy can't fall into the nucleus and how it doesn't fall into the nucleus, this one absolutely cannot fall into the nucleus. Now this one can't fall into the nucleus because the Coulomb potential is minus one over R but the um, rotational potential goes as one over r squared. Okay, so that's like worse, right? One over a small number is bad, but one over a small number squared, right, blows up really freaking quick. So what's happening again is that as the electron, if it's whizzing around in a p state, and it just happens to get a little close, it spins faster, uh, but it's just, it's just the energetic consequences, like way more than what you have with a, an s state. And so that wave function actually does have to get it to zero, uh, even if I multiply it by the Jacobian or not. Um, it, it has to go to zero because otherwise it would 
it was just exploding energy. So, so no. Um, now a a that would be a two. This would be a two piece beat, two piece bait. Maybe I'll draw a one piece bait and tell you what's wrong. The answer is there is no one piece bait. Uh, and the rest of these these aren't hard. So a three P looks like this. Yeah, that's easy because um, here, I'll dash it. Maybe it'll be a little easier watching the video. Um, and the reason that is is um, uh, it has a node, so so you still see the same behavior zero zero, and it has a node, so therefore it's not the first piece state; it's the second piece state. That's a three P. So there you go. Not too hard. Just think about think about. You learned this in high school, you learned this in freshman. It just now comes in an equation form, but there's some nuances to it, but it's all basically the same stuff. So, uh, okay, um, next thing, next thing. More on rotation. Uh, just heads up on one thing. Um, I, when I was Googling, uh, when I realized I'd made a transcription error for your textbook on the, some of these wave functions, when you Google hydrogen wave functions, it turns out you'll find two different sets. Uh, and sometimes some wave, page, some wave, um, some web pages. God, I ain't losing it. Some web pages uh, will make this explicit, explicitly describe this, and some don't, which is dangerous. Um, sometimes the normalizations, like the normalizations, I think I did on the homework, are not the same as this one. You see, the reason is, and again, so there, there's like, if you ever look for what are the hydrogen radial wave functions, you'll actually find two different sets of listings, and they differ by the normalizations. It depends on whether they've included the spherical harmonics or not. And so that basically introduces like that four pi difference that we were even talking about last time. So heads up on that. But anyway, so um, and that's just not a big deal. The, the thing to do, that I'll do for you is just to make sure that I'm, it's clear which one's which. Uh, and that is, um, and I, that just means I set up the problem correctly. Uh, okay, so uh, rotation. Rotational wave functions. You did this last time on the, the homework and on the present homework I had you do more of looking at the rotational part of the wave functions uh, because there's something that's kind of funky about that. Um, let's look at the spherical harmonics. And remember this little y um, means um, this Y is just they, the, the, the community, the nomenclature, people do not use a little psi for the wave function when it comes to angular. Uh, they use a little Y instead. I actually kind of find that useful when I run into these professionally. And that means spherical harmonics. Spherical harmonics, of course, are the angular wave functions for hydrogen atoms and whatnot. And um, so anyway, I, I, I will keep doing that because I do run into these quite often. Okay, so let me, um, oh here, let, let, me, let me do these as a function, as a function of M. Let me graph it a little bit. This, this will make a little bit more sense if I do it this way. Okay, so zero again is cosine. Um, so remember that these are S states. Plus one is sine, and then, um, Recall our 2D rigid rotor, uh, so I M phi, but uh, but these are M of one, so uh, so then this guy is either minus I phi. Remember that's still I M phi, it's just M is one, so don't don't want to return to that. Okay, now if therefore a wave function, uh, what, what am I doing? P state. So let's say 2P. So I have a 2P radial times y l equals 1, m equals 0, um, is what? Now, let me remind you that in spherical coordinates, I don't ever remember these. When I see these, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Z is r cos, x is r cos theta. There's no phi in it uh, for z. And then you see a phi in uh, x and y. Uh, X is X, X is, I just forgot. Sine, I screwed up, sorry, sine, sine theta. Let me make this neater, sorry. Sine theta cos phi and y is r, because I'm screwing up today, let me go ahead and see. 
That's R double sine. Yeah, R is double sine. I remember that. Sine theta, sine t. Okay. So, um, so therefore, um, let, let's see here. Um, y equal one, m equal. Okay, if m equals zero. I don't know why I'm drawing a little line into that. What, what do we got? What we, so that's a 2p what? Now, remember that the angular wave function is going to go like, remember there's like an r in here? Let me, let me double check. Uh, where's a 2p? Oh, there's my 2p. Okay, 2, 1, 0, right? That's, uh, that's, that's a 2p. I actually, r and b boy, the answer. r um, cos. Okay, so what is r cos? What kind of p state is that? Given, right, right. So again, you know that there's an R to the L component in the radial. Um, the L equals one. It has to be L equals one. That's a P state, right? That's what I'm describing. M equals zero is R cos. That's it. So this is a P state. Okay. Psi two P. R. Okay, so let's do L equals one, M equals one. And I get it. I'm actually. I know, uh, if you're thinking like, wait, have I seen this before? Yes, this is on your homework. I'm just reminding you. Okay. Sine theta e to the i c. Now, I, to be blunt, I've used up z. Okay, so I've narrowed it down. That was for you. There's not two p z states. That doesn't make sense. This is going to be a p x or a p y. Which one is it? Hmm? It begins with N and rhymes with either. It's neither. No, 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 no. This doesn't correspond to anything. No. No, that is not the wave function for anything. Now, here's the reason. Remember that these, uh, these deals the spherical harmonics are for things that are rotating. Now, now, especially if you actually have any momentum, remember that the spherical harmonics allow things to choose not to rotate. Those are S states. L equals zero means it's not rotating. There's no rotational energy. Remember, rotational energy is L times L plus one. So you're allowed to not rotate, which is kind of weird, but anyway. Now, if you are rotating, um, then these are your wave functions. Now, that implies that the hydrogen, now seriously, that implies that I said so like so like the electron's doing this. And so that means that the hydrogen atom is doing this. Right? Remember, remember we talked about angular momentum? Okay, so if we could shrink ourselves down and look at a hydrogen atom, do you think that you would see this? No. No, it's it's, it's like it's like because the hydrogen atom exists in, in a two P state, it's spinning like a top. No, that would require it requires energy to do that. Where's it getting it? Right? So no. So now, you, get, I, you remember what the solution is? What's the solution? How, how do I stop it from rotating? That, 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 Jesus, you did this on the last homework. What did you do? Or two. Linear combination. Linear combination. Subtract out. Subtract out. Uh, well, actually, here, let me add them. Let me add them. That would be a little bit more intuitive. Um, if it's got a component of m plus 1, add in the minus 1 component. Remember, you can do that stuff. Remember how I told you, you've seen this before. Remember how, damn it, um, we've told you your whole life that light is plane polarized, right? Right? We've always drawn it this way when you had physics E and M. And I told you, and it sounded like a lot of you heard this for the first time, that light is not like that. Light actually does this, right? That's, um, that might be right or left, I keep forgetting. This is the other one that's right or left, whatever. All right, so light actually does that because it has rotational. It has angular momentum. Weird, it does, <laughs> all right. Okay, plane polarized light is just a combination of the two. Plane polarized light exists. Remember when you were a kid, you had those polarizers? They, they brought them out in science class. You had a polarizer, you look at the light, then you get another one and you turn it. You remember? You didn't do that, right? Right, so, so plane polarized light exists. It's just a linear combination of left and right circularly polarized light. So there's nothing wrong with that. 
So this is how you keep the hydrogen atom from rotating on its own, which would be weird and magical uh, and wrong. So uh, again, this, um, this, this just solves the problem. All right, so what is it though? Okay, let's figure that out. So, um, so we end up still with a, so we still get a sine, we get a sine uh, theta, we get e to the i, i phi, plus e to the minus i phi, which is basically what? Sine or cosine? It's cosine. Right, right, this is cosine. Sine, uh, sine theta, cosine phi, it's a what, it's a what? A hermit. Px, it's a Px. Right, it's a Px. Well, uh, well, yeah. So sine two, uh, a side two p of r, and then a. Sorry, I'm writing this all different today. I don't know why. It's Friday, that's why. M equals one. Now this is going to be kind of strange. Uh, and I can't really understand, I don't understand it too well myself. Uh, this is obviously a PY, right? Because e to the IP minus e to the minus IP is a sine function. Uh, another thing is it's the only one left, right? <laughs> I've got uh, uh, L1, M0 is PZ, and then I make linear combinations to get X, and um, you can either figure out what Y is, or you can just realize, well, there's only one left. That's fine. That works. Okay. What I don't quite get, I never really really understood this to tell the blunt honest truth, is why, I, I mean I get it. Plus one plus minus one equals zero. That I've understood since second grade. But why plus one minus minus one is zero? <laughs> I don't really get that. I never really understood why that works out. But it does. Um, uh, so anyway, just I want to point out there's some weirdness there. I mean, this I get, this I just I never have. It seems like I should have figured it out by now, but I haven't. Okay, so there you go. Um, and I want to point out now, there again, the reason we do that is if you didn't, the hydrogen atom is spinning like a top. Um, kind of like uh, now, you know, now some of you did the homework right last week. Some of you right. So. <laughs> Remember that Bohr's model? Remember what was wrong with Bohr's model for the hydrogen atom? That he actually got right answer. He got the right energy. I mean, he got a lot of things right with this model, but there's a phenomenological problem, which is that if the electron is truly orbiting, so everything is, the, the electron is always rotating, then it should be shooting out, shooting out radio waves. It should be shooting out light. It's, it's an electric field that's oscillating. And it should be shooting out light at all times, and then and then it loses energy. That it, it does it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's cool that it described almost everything, but an electron that's rotating would generate light on its own, just the same way as a radio transmitter works. That that's how radio towers work. Right? They sh they shoot electrons up, and that, that's how those things work. It's just a giant metal tower with a ton of electrons that go up and down, producing radio wave photons, and there you go. Cell phone towers are just smaller. Um, this assures that because of this model and the ability to write these linear combinations so that the hydrogen atom doesn't actually rotate, it fixed the problem just at the hideous expense of quantum mechanics. But it did have the benefit of giving right answers. Uh, okay, the next bit, and then we'll move on from here, is uh, D states. So you have to do the D states on your homework. I'll do one of them. Um, because they're a little bit more complicated. The same problem applies. If you are a D state you, and you just adopt a spherical harmonic, you are rotating. And again, that doesn't make sense. That would require some kind of input, continuous input of energy. Uh, you would have probably like a Bohr model type problem where, uh, again, an electron is spinning around. Uh, in a way that it should be working like a little radio transmitter. Um, that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, and the solution is to make linear combinations. Okay, so what I want to do is, um, uh, I, I wrote down the um, spherical harmonics for L equals 2. That means a D, right? And let's see here, what I want to do here. Um, okay, so where do, 
Um, so you, you know that the d orbitals are, now I, I never quite remember these, I did write them down before class. Uh, you got dz squared, you got xz, yz. Uh, so you can kind of just make permutations, that's one way I remember them. Uh, xy, <coughs> xy, and then the weird one is x squared minus y squared, okay. Two each, and that makes 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, so 10 electrons, there you go. Okay, so now how does that come about? All right, now it's kind of obvious how the game works. What you're going to do is you're going to have a radial, let's make it a 3D uh, state, on a 2D state or a 1D state if I see you put that on the test. I'm going to try to trick you. I'm going to try to trick you on the next test from writing about a 1D state which doesn't exist, right? Um, because of that separability in funnels like that. Okay, so the wave functions are going to be linear combinations. Now, obviously, the game is kind of simple, right? Um, I'm trying to make sure I do the one. Okay, so on, on the homework, what I do is I do this. L equals 2, M equals plus 2. And then you do all the others. So you have to do uh, four others. So obviously you add 2 plus minus 2, then you subtract 2, minus minus 2, weird, but it apparently works. Then you identify the L equals 2, M equals 1, plus M equals minus 1, M equals 1, minus M equals minus 1, you just identify it. Then you see where all the D orbitals come from. That's, that's the point of the exercise. I'm going to do this one for you uh, because it, it, shows, it shows a little funkiness to this. Uh, so I want you to see that so you can do your homework uh, without, without too much trouble. You may notice I gave a hint on the homework if you looked at it. Uh, let me point out that the spherical harmonic for L equals 2, M equals uh, plus 2, minus 2 are, uh, where, where, where am I at in my own notes? Um, I think that's sine theta squared, um, then that would be e to the I two phi, that's uh, plus two minus two is uh, even the minus I two phi, there you go, um, e to the minus M phi, right? Um, so I got two minus two, so there you go. Okay, now again, the reason I wanted you to see this one is that it ends up being, uh, oh, oh, sorry, 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 I wanted to remind you that's radial, there's a radial component. Uh, so there's still a radial component. Now what does this turn into? So I can factor the sine theta squared, and I'm left with the e to the 2 i phi plus e to the minus 2 i phi. Um, and again, these I'm just working down. Okay, what is this? Sine, and now again, uh, yeah, now remember you've got, oh damn it, you can't, um, so you've got z is r cos theta, uh, y is r sine, sine, uh, x is sine, <coughs> sine cosine. Um, so I'm seeing something that looks like, uh, you, you see with the sine theta squared, I'm sorry you can't see the x, but um, it looks like this could be an x squared or a y squared as it looks like right now. Um, so I got to turn this into a sine or a cosine, right? Because otherwise it doesn't match my, my knowledge of x, y, and z in, in r theta phi. So tell me how to turn that to a sine or a cosine. Oh, do you divide by the... Uh... Well, don't worry about now. One thing... Uh, now this is going to... Um, you're all way off. Okay, it is. Hold on. So we're going to keep this thing because it's got the right sine cosine. This is cosine two phi. Yes, yeah, cosine. It's cosine two phi. It's a plus, not a minus. So. It's a, yeah. It's right. The only thing that matters is right here. Plus or minus. Plus is cosine. Minus is sine. Now, some of you, one of you hacked on, and you should have. You should have. This always still bothered me. Where's the over 2? Or, or if it was a sign, where's the over 2i? Where is that? The answer is it doesn't matter. Because ultimately, these get normalized. 
So if you, if you, when we're assembling these, you know, when we, oh, okay, well, I've, a, I've been asked to write out the three uh, D uh, wave function. I'll look in a table for the radial part. Okay, it's R squared e to the minus R over A naught. Okay. Now I'm going to look at the spherical harmonics. Where, where are they? Let me put the ones, the, the right ones together. Okay. When you do all that, then you're going to end up normalizing it. So if there's a little over 2i or not over 2i, it doesn't matter. It's just going to get wiped out with normalization. So I'm not worried about uh, the fact that this, I mean, this looks like a cosine, except I expect it to be over 2, and it's not, but it just doesn't matter because normalization is going to wipe it out anyway. So this is cosine. Okay, now, I am still trying to figure out how to map, um, damn, it's just driving me nuts with kids, <laughs> especially where I'm at. I'm, you know, at a different angle with you folks. Um, I got to fix this because it's driving me nuts. Okay, so uh, x is um, sine, cosine, there we go. I'm actually writing as bad today. Okay, so now I can see it. Okay, so now your goal is to figure out um, which one of these things is this, given that you know what uh, x, y, and z are. Now I can see, okay, we can eliminate z squared, right? We can eliminate anything with z, because z's got a cos. It's got a cos theta. And so I can get rid of that. So no z squared. So what have I got left? Um, z squared, no. Um, oh, I'm looking right here. xz, no. yz. I'm almost done. So it's xy or, or, or x squared minus y squared. OK, now that I know that, I can look at it again. xy, um, xy, OK, I, I see the sine squared. But xy is cosine phi, and that's not that. x squared minus y squared is definitely not that. So what have I done? Have I screwed up? Did I do what? Can you rewrite this in 2 Could I rewrite what? Use a... Identity. identity. Look at an identity. Right. So on the homework, you may notice I gave you some identity. Gave you these one yeah, double angle identities. Right. So right. Double, yeah. Double angle is that that's called. Yeah. And hopefully you know how to do that because the way to solve double angle identities is right. Cosine and sine is e to the i whatever, and it makes that all way easier. Okay. So now let's do that. Uh, I look in a in a table of numbers, and I see that um, I just Google it basically uh, to tell the honest truth. That ends up being uh, cosine squared. So uh, cosine two theta is actually cos theta squared minus sine theta squared, and that makes this what? Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, it's kind of obvious because it's minus, right? So. Um, what did I just do that for? Okay, so there you go. All right, so now you can see how you do your homework. Um, you've got four other of these. This one minus that one. You can probably figure it out like right now. Um, you need an identity, actually. I show you the identities. Uh, plus one, my, uh, plus minus one, plus one, minus minus one, and then you've got the end zero. Of course, that's z squared. I'm just going to tell you that. It's obvious. And um, yeah, and anyway, that's where they come from. And that's about it. Uh, last bit is on your homework. I am not going to quite, I'll give you an idea how to do this. Uh, and we'll break for 10 minutes. And I'll probably definitely end class a little early today. But again, I want to show you something that is probably a really good question that helps summarize this class. So please stick around. I got one other neat thing I could show you about time to quantum mechanics that I would not have you see again, but it's just kind of neat anyway. Uh, okay, so the next subject to answer a couple of questions on your homework is spectroscopy, which is we're you know kind of really almost out of time in this class. We're almost done. Uh, 
So the next, next Monday, we're going to start on multi-electron wave functions. Um, not a lot of time there. Spectroscopy. And then I, I'm not going to go over the quantum mechanics of spectroscopy. I'm going to do that today. Maybe it's spilled, it'll spill a little, a little over into Monday. I'm going to go over the types of spectroscopy. It's just kind of a laundry list. It's kind of like nosebleed easy. It's probably, probably kind of boring. Uh, and then we do kinetics around, that's around the, the third exam, then that's only a week to the final exam, so geez, we're almost done. Okay, when it comes to spectroscopy, there's really only one thing you need to know. Uh, this one thing is how you do this with quantum mechanics, and then what happens is you can go into such a rabbit hole of details like, okay, what kind of wave function, what kind of electromagnetic radiation. You can go down such a rabbit hole, you can spend a whole class. And I know because I'm helping design one next semester. <laughs> so it does tend to be for graduate students. Uh, undergrads could, sometimes undergrads take these classes. It's kind of rare. But when it comes to spectroscopy, there are details that can fill a class, but they're all based on one simple thing, which is the dipole. Um, equals changes in dipole. Okay, so if you forgot, a dipole is, let's put something with a positive charge, and here's something with a negative charge. And remember that the dipole equations and dipolar this, dipolar that, these are all just simplifications of Coulomb's law when you have two charges. The thing is, you always have two charges. <laughs> Things almost always come charge balanced. So the hydrogen atom, so where's the hydrogen atom? Right, that's the proton, there's your electron. So it's dipolar. Now let me ask you this, is an S state, does that have a dipole moment? It might. God, yes, kind of slayed me there. You're supposed to say no, by the way, that's why. You're supposed to say no because it's round, right? So if the, if the um, if this guy is spinning around perfectly, what would be the dipole? Zero. Yeah, yeah, it, if you look at it for long enough, and long enough is like, now remember my little quantum dynamic simulation? If you look at it long enough, which would be like 10 to the minus 15 seconds, which is really fast, um, this thing whizzes around really, really, really quick. And the sum of the vectors would be zero. zero. Right. So if you think of this as a dipole moment as, as a vector, it, it, it just washes out to zero. Um, now, here's the thing though, when molecules interact, because electrons can move so quickly, at any given moment, if two hydrogen atoms get nearby each other, for that brief moment in time, they actually do see each other's dipolar behavior. For a very brief, like, and I'm talking instantaneous, which goes by real quick, for a brief moment in time, even a hydrogen atom is a dipole if you can stop time. But molecules respond very quickly to each other because of how fast electron moves, and that's what I showed you in my little quantum dynamical simulation last time, where you saw an electron moving in a little trap on the order of 10 to the minus 18 seconds, the attoseconds. So if electrons move that quickly, and if we could, you know, it's like be the flash, um, you would see those electrons move around, and you would feel the dipolar nature of the proton and electron. Okay, so, it turns out, um, so that there's this distance, and so the dipole moment, the dipole moment is basically, so let's say, we're assuming that they're charge balanced, right? So you've got plus Q or minus Q is uh, Q dot into the V, and of course the V is the vector because it can point in a certain direction, so there you go. Uh, don't worry about, um, actually, actually that is kind of important. This is going to come up a little bit. Um, okay, so here's what it come, all comes down to. Let me tell you, everything you need to know about spectroscopy and everything else is kind of a hideously complex detail. It turns out that if you absorb light, if you absorb light, you need a change in dipole. Now that's the electric field of light doing that. The light is primarily an electric field. Remember, it's an electric and magnetic field. The magnetic component 
is really weak. Magnetism is a weak force. Electric fields are pretty strong. They're definitely stronger compared to magnetism. So when light interacts with uh, atoms, it's mostly doing it overwhelmingly with its electric field. So when it's doing that, and now I can, I can think of these as plane waves, because plane waves exist. Uh, what's happening is, is that the electrons are being jostled about by the, by the electric field of light, which is changing their dipole moment. But if you do that, you put the thing in the excited state, you absorb the photon. So that's exactly how this works. So to understand spectroscopy, what you need to do is understand how dipole moments change. Uh, and yeah, that's actually it. So here's how you do that, quantum mechanically. Okay, so if we, okay, spectroscopy are changes in dipole, that's due to absorption of light. And how do you do a change in, in a dipole with quantum mechanics? The way you do that is this way. You are going to take a wave function, and this will be the final state. Now it's on the left, so that means it's going to be the complex conjugate deal. Hasn't really shown up with hydrogen atoms cool, right? You know, sometimes we get a letter I, sometimes we don't. If we don't have a letter I, this doesn't mean anything. All right. Then you get what's called the dipole operator. Okay, and then you get the initial state. And um, you need to integrate over all, sorry, this is a little catch, it's like a little symbol for integration over all R theta's and T's. So I, hope, I don't know if you've seen that before, but, but anyway. Um, so let me, let me write that down. I, I see this all the time. Um, it's just that, you know, back in the day, they really just didn't want, writing want to write equations 10 miles long. So instead of writing um, sine theta r squared dr d theta d phi, they would just put a little tau, d tau, and that's what that means. So, uh, question, just for notation wise, if you want to just constrict r but leave everything else through all the ranges, would you include just the integral of r and then have d tau? Uh, well, 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 right, I'm going I'm to show you that here in a second. So. So now, so the thing is, is that, so you're asking, well, how does this partition up if, if I have R theta and phi? Depends on the dipole operator. So, all right, now, now, big picture, this thing tells you whether you absorb light and how strongly. This is basically related to the absorption coefficient. Like, you, you know, Beard's Law, you learned that in high school. What you're really looking for is zero or not zero. <laughs> That's what we're more concerned about in physical sciences. Is it zero or not zero? If it is zero, then this combination of initial state, and that'll be the ground state. Things are generally in the ground state. I'm going to talk about that in the next hour. This is some excited state. So when I have measured the spectra of a molecule and I want to assign the spectroscopic transitions, it's pretty safe to assume that you're in the ground state. We'll just take that for given. And then the spectroscopic transitions are defined by what's the final state. You figure that out by zero or not. If it's zero, then that feature you see in the absorption is probably not due to that final state being um, populated. If it is not zero, but small, then that would be like a weak feature in the absorption. A Peter's Law coefficient that would be small. And if it's like a really big number, and that's kind of arbitrary, if that sounds arbitrary, it actually kind of is. Uh, but if it still comes out to be a big number, relatively speaking, then that's like a strong feature in your absorption. So that's really all we're looking for. Um, our ability to do this correctly is not very good, so we're really just looking for, for reasons I have, maybe I'll get into it at some point, but um, that's really the name of the game. All right, now, again, ground state, so this would be like hydrogen 1s, because that's, that's the ground state, and this would be a hydrogen Two, let's make it a 2s or a 2p, x, y, and z. And we can do the same game with three, uh, 3s and 3p and 3d and 4s. We can do it for everything. Of course, we'll just pick one or two examples, and I give you the idea. Now, the last bit I wanted to cover, and then I'm, I'm just going to be a little over, and then we'll do the 10 minute break, uh, is the nature of the dipole operator. Okay, so. From here, you see that the dipole is just basically a, a, a linear displacement 
in, um, in the case of a hydrogen, uh, has a hydrogen atom, it's just a linear displacement between the uh, proton and the electron. That's all it is. It's a linear displacement. So that means that the dipole operator, dipole operator is basically x, y, and z. That's really all it comes down to. And what that is for, so what, what does it represent? It represents x, y, z polarized light. There you go. So, uh, so we actually, as much as I was ballyhooing about circularly polarized light, left and right and whatnot, plain polarized light exists. If I'm doing experiments in a, in a real laboratory setting, I'm going to polarize my light because then I understand it extremely well. And that means I now understand the dipole operator. I'm just going to plug in an X, Y, or Z. And again, for reasons that are kind of you know, not, I kind of would rather not admit, you're just looking for zero or not zero. And then you can assign your, your spectrum in your PCHEM lab. Uh, I guess you engineers aren't doing that. But in PCHEM lab, the students actually, they, they literally have to do this for PCHEM lab for, uh, for an infrared transition. Okay, last bit. Uh, now, you were asking about how do we divvy this up between R theta and phi? Because notice I wrote this out in X, Y, and Z. Polarized light, X, Y, and Z, you know that. But my hydrogen atom is in R theta phi. What I do? Oh, fix one or the other. Huh? Let me fix one or the other. What do you mean fix that? It's X, Y, Z, right? Well, let's say that you're using, let's say you're using Z polarized. Then the dipole operator is what? Cosine. There you go. It was the R cosine. Yeah. There you go. Right. So then, what you then plug in is R cosine theta, and then you've got two sets of integrals. You've got a radial integral with the radial of it, one again one S state. Right, hydrogen is in the ground one S state. Um, an R, and then you've got a final state, and that is whatever you want to query. You see an absorption spectrum. Is that from the ground state? Again, it's always from the ground state. Is it to a 2s state or a 2p state or a 3s state or a 3? You plug in what you think this is and you see for zero. Now, then you've got the angular part, and so you're going to you're going to integrate the angular wave function for an s state. That's just a constant, so that's not too hard. Uh, cosine and times the final state, whatever that, again, that's, you, you tell me what that is, and you've seen how to calculate your rotational wave function. Okay, so next time I'm going to give you an example, and better yet, you're doing it on your homework, so you're definitely going to figure this out. Because uh, I've gone way over. Thanks.